Hello, everyone. Welcome to 2022, the ongoing biennial conversation circle. Uh, my name is Pedro Lash, and I am an artist and the director of the social practice lab here at Duke University. And we are organizing this series. Uh, it started in January, and it all goes all the way until mid-May. Uh, I will in a moment introduce our special guest today, Andrea Junta. Uh, but before I do so, I would like to also thank our respondent for today, Sylvie Fautin. Uh, Sylvie is the editor of PASS, the Journal of the International Biennial Association. And she's also currently a curator in residence at the Bemis Center for Contemporary Arts. Thanks, Sylvie, for joining us uh, today. Um, Andrea Junta, uh, thanks, Andrea. I know you were not feeling very well yesterday, but we're really glad that you were able to make it <laughs> after all. Um, and Andrea is joining us from Buenos Aires in, in Argentina. And she's a professor at the University of Buenos Aires, uh, where she also got her PhD. Uh, she has worked in multiple institutions before that, at Duke University, at the Ecole des Hautes Etudes de Sciences Sociales in Paris. She was also, she's been awarded many grants like the Guggenheim, the Getty, the Rockefeller, uh, the Tinker Visiting Professor at Columbia University. And I won't spend too much time on, on her, 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 her bio, but I think what, what one of the reasons I'm excited to have you here with us today, Andrea, is that you have a really strong trajectory, not just as a curator, but also as a scholar who, who has published so much on, on Latin American art and, and feminist art, but also has put on some of the most important exhibitions, I believe, like Radical Women, the exhibit you did with Cecilia Fajardo Gil. I was lucky to see it at the Brooklyn Museum and it was just an incredible exhibition. So I was really happy to see when Mercosur, you know, invited you to be the curator for, for that biennial, which is the one that we'll start talking to. But so in addition to your scholarship, you've also helped museums like Malva and other institutions to really work on their collections, right? Which is a very important a role that, that scholars can can play. So we're really glad to have you here as part of this cycle where your contributions are in conversation with the other guests we've had in the series. And to begin uh, uh, our conversation, I was thinking we could talk about basically Mercosur because not only is it of course a biennial, but you were one of the curators in our series who actually was, was challenged by the pandemic directly. And some of our guests had already finished curating, right? Or were, hadn't even started, but you were in the midst of it when COVID, you know, uh, basically started. So, um, so I think uh, we could start perhaps with hearing from you about that whole adventure from how you thought of Mercosur and then how, how you had to adjust your plans of Mercosur. And then we can kind of move more into your overall trajectory. Um, and then Sylvie will join us with, with some uh, additional questions and comments. Does that sound uh, good? Yeah, it sounds perfect. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. I, you know, this biennial has been a, a very complex experience and every time I have the opportunity to present it, well, I have the possibility to think new consequences or, um, you know, um, unfolding the biennial and all the experience in different ways. Um, just to make a short narration and we can move after to see a little bit a, a PowerPoint because I know that when people uh, is attending to a lecture to a biennial, they want to see a little bit what, which way are the artists and, and I think that uh, to see some images and works of the artists, is, it's good. Um, but just for making a short narration, um, I would like to, to add to, to the list of exhibitions you mentioned, because it was very important for me, was the retrospective exhibition of Leon Ferrari that maybe you don't remember, but it was in 2004 and was a big international debate around this exhibition that was uh, considered as, um, it was condemned for Bergoglio, that was the, the bishop of the city, now the Pope. And it was an exhibition that allowed me to be aware of how much an exhibition can have a social impact then this exhibition became really a social performance, no? because everybody, it was uh, installed in the city as a, 
as a social discussion. No, that is something that I don't think that frequently happened so strongly as it happened with this exhibition. But this make me be aware that, uh, okay, I can have some, you know, power of changing ways of thinking through my writing. I can have some uh, influence or not influence, you know, to help to think through art, through uh, my teaching. But an exhibition was a different thing, you know, to be in the space is like, you know, it's amazing. Then, uh, since then, I don't consider myself a curator as the main thing or the principal thing I do. I consider myself more a professor, but uh, curating exhibitions became part of my professional life. And then I am a curator now, I think, uh, because some exhibitions like uh, Radical Women, the impact this exhibition had, and uh, now the Biennial and several other projects, I became involved uh, in the context of the pandemic. Then I was thinking a lot what means for the art world this, the new situation of the world, a world that changes and that uh, makes us to move to different uh, platforms that are not uh, um, the, the room the teaching room is not uh, the, the exhibition space because we have to negotiate all the time between presential activities and digital participation. No? Then uh, we are in a moment when a lot of things are changing. And my position is that, uh, well, many colleagues decided that in this moment when museums were closed, we should not do anything because art should be presential and the experience to be in touch directly with the work of art is uh, not possible to be replaced for any other experience. Um, I agree until such a point that presentiality is essential for, for the appreciation, uh, the experience of art, but at the same time, I think we have an enormous responsibility at this moment because uh, the first thing we saw when the pandemic and the, the, the close of everything came uh, was that many museums decided to fire uh, an important part of the staff and particularly educational uh, departments that were dismantled. Uh, and I don't want to list what institutions, but you know per perfectly that many uh, central institutions make this decision. I think that uh, we need to be more committed with education because the experience uh, around the world is that uh, schools are closed, um, the education is in between question marks, what it will happen with education. And I really believe that art has a relevant role to play in this new scenario. And that we should be really committed to the research of what are the ways in which a work of art can be uh, productive, useful, collaborative uh, for uh, making uh, central the issue of education. No? Um, then, well, all my work since uh, <laughs> March 2020 has been dedicated to think um, how um, to think in the meanwhile, you know, in the meanwhile, we don't have the exhibition space. In the meanwhile, well, biennials should be redefined completely because biennials uh, are part of a moment of global art, of globalization, uh, which is in this moment. Uh, in question, no? We were very sure about uh, the global world, the globalization processes that are really global. Biennials, we are defining a global circuit all over the world. You can even plan your trip to go to one biennial and then to the other, to the other, to the other, and go to three, four cities because it was organized uh, in this 
new world representation, no? But what is happening now, you know, that corporative buildings of uh, global companies are empty. Uh, all these areas of the city where these corporative buildings are concentrated are empty. <laughs> we don't know what it will happen with Saskia's passing uh, theorization uh, about global cities, you know, because what is happening is that cities are completely fragmented at this moment and creates like uh, independent areas where nobody goes there. And then uh, it's, it's a crisis, really. Then I think that the, the concept of biennial is in crisis in terms and, of- you know, the, um... Andrea, maybe you know this. This could be a good way because, you in, know, in, in some ways, you've of course you've always been a critical thinker and a critical curator, right? So, so when you were asked to do Mercosur, you probably already had a set of critical approaches to the concept of the biennial, right? So, um, Charlie, so I'm I'm curious how you if if you had any such notions, how they then were put in contrast. In other words, if we could kind of rewind and see where you were in your mind when you were asked to curate Mercosur, right? And then mm -hmm. how that adjusted to, to when okay. you were faced with the reality of, okay. of the transformation you're describing, right? Okay, okay. Um, no, uh, I have to say that I am critical to my colleagues that were critical toward uh, biennials. <laughs> uh, and in the, in the way that, uh, okay, biennials are a very superficial process, you know, it um, doesn't make sense, you can see, it works uh, made for the biennial. Even some colleagues talk about the cemetery of, cemeteries of biennials, of course, because you have bigger uh, installations that after, you know, are acquired for a collector that has an, uh, an installation park <laughs> and many things could happen. But uh, my perspective was always, I am very, you know, I think that every time that art has the possibility to occupy a space should be, should be made, should be down this occupation. And for me, the, the challenging thing is not to criticize the biennial, but to see what the biennial allows me to criticize the order of the world or to change something that has to do with the world of art. Then I am, I will never use a biennial for, for doing an empty biennial, for criticizing the system biennial. No, I want a celebration of art because I think that art <laughs> is fantastic and it has a great opportunity to have a powerful intervention. Then, um, well, I don't know, I don't have a critical skepticism towards Biennale. Not, also not a celebration, no? I, for me, it's um, sad when I go to a Biennale and I see that the curator lost the opportunity to, to do something, you know, that is making a point. Uh, because of this skepticism, no? Well, um, but this, uh, positions I respect, but I, I always prefer to use the stage for, for doing something. Uh, I was in Paris when I received the proposal for presenting a project for the Biennale, Le Biennale uh, that it was um, conceived as a Biennale for women artists. Um, I was uh, going to Sao Paulo for the last installation of Radical Women exhibition and then, of course, it was the possibility to move beyond the chronological order of uh, Radical Women, that was an exhibition between 1960 and 1985, and to go to another problematics connected with feminism. Um, Bolsonaro was not in power when I presented this, the first project. Then that's why I think, well, the first context of this biennial was well how to think feminism beyond the the chronological frame uh, we were um, we were using for radical women. Then um, the the title is eloquent femini femininos femininos with an s that makes a question no many feminisms and visualities, actions, and affects. And this was the title. Um, then uh, when I arrived to, 
to Sao Paulo um, at the end of the exhibition of radical women, uh, Bolsonaro came into power. Then it happened the same that happened in the States, you know, because when the exhibition Radical Women opened at the Hammer Museum was when uh, Trump went into power. Then uh, an exhibition that was conceived in a context became a very radical exhibition in this new context. Then this is very important because you can have a, an idea about the exhibition, but the context makes its part, no? Then here is like a two lines, no, to show uh, what was the, the physical biennial that will be opening on April 16 and closed in 4 of July, and the biennial online that was more time, and it's still online. You can, you can see all the videos and all the works online. Um, I was in uh, Buenos Aires in uh, when when the, the close down came, and and then the first issue was to send the artists that were already in Porto Alegre city to their countries because all the airports were in, were closing, and to stop the artists that were traveling to Porto Alegre for not to come. And this was a very difficult decision because we didn't know if uh, it will be for 15 days, for one month. But I was uh, reading tons of scientific articles about pandemia, and I thought, no, this, this is a, it's a big issue, and it's not just for one month. Then um, my team was paralyzed. I will show the team also. This is it's interesting because it's uh, how it was conceived, no, the biennial. Um, the question for me, and in comparison with Radical Women, that was uh, an, an exhibition where um, African Latin American artists were uh, not as represented as Cecilia and I wanted, then we have the opportunity to go more into. Uh, the, a, a, a broader concept of representation. Then it was a big discussion with the curatorial team about uh, how, how much the press wants to know about how many people from different countries, how many black people, how many gay, how many lesbians in these kind of exhibitions, no? Um, then we used the text by Denise Ferreira da Silva, um, using the concept of difference as multiplicity, but not like separation. Then even if I will show you now some pictures uh, with the portraits of the artists, um, this is something we introduced in the digital version, but uh, we plan it for the physical exhibition, not to provide this kind of information to the press. Then it means poetics, works of art are there, but without classification. Then representation without separation. No? Uh, then, of course, it was in my horizon of, of, of the size uh, the, the, to go beyond the binar binary logics, bo both of gender, race, and class, uh, the participation from the concepts of difference, and also to conceive the biennial, how it will be happening physically as a sensitive contract it means the, the space, the platform um, of the biennial as a place for exchanging visualities, no? and the concept of democratic life. Of course, it was Bolsonaro in power when we were really going into this issue. Then we were moving a little bit from feminism towards uh, the richness of democratic life, no? Because really, <laughs> democracy was uh, on fire uh, at this moment and still is, no? Then um, this is interesting how, how concepts and purposes are moving, no? Then um, this was the team, the curatorial team, for me was very important uh, to have an specialist in African Latin American art uh, that was Fabiana Lopez. She's a specialist also on Caribbean, uh, Afro-Caribbean and African art. 
Dorota Vixo, that's a specialist in Peruvian, Ecuador, and East countries um, art. And Igor Simoes, he is a curator from Porto Alegre. It was somebody, I, I didn't select the curators because somebody said about this. No, all people that or I already knew or I was looking for their work online. Then Igor Simoes is someone, is an art historian and curator from Porto Alegre. And I discovered a project that it was uh, the title uh, Black Voices in the White Cube that I find in very interesting. And he was uh, um, acting as a pedagogical curator. Then it was uh, really a wonderful team. And these are the spaces where the Biennale happened, no? the Museum of Art of Art of Rio Grande do Sul, the Memorial, Memor the Memorial, and the uh, Iberica Camargo Foundation. And it has a big square. Then this concept of democracy was very um, um, was uh, articulated, was conceived as being articulated through the, the square. And also it's a city that is very connected with water. And this representation shows you uh, its connection with the Atlantic, with Africa, and also with the slavery, no? because uh, Rio Grande do Sul was an important center of um, slavery. And here, well, the artists, for you to have you know, the, the richness of their presence, <laughs> they, are, they are there. And it says 25 countries, but really we're 24 countries more than 70 artists because it were several collectives. And uh, the, the editorial project that became online editorial project, and you can download through a PDF, very accessible, um, is a, a journal that is um, putting together the voices of the artists in, in, in the three languages that we think that you have to handle for understanding Latin American art, that is Spanish, Portuguese, and English. And um, uh, the seminar, the international seminar that didn't happen, but even so we did the book with more than 50 papers and the catalog that uh, we are ending still the, the, the design, no? But it will be accessible and also publication about the pedagogical program that had for 12 um, propositions and it was i can talk about the pedagogical program because it was enormous but uh, it was really one of the most important parts of the biennial online with a lot of leaps programs but also um, it was an open call for educators for creating through workshops with them the activities. And when the call was uh, launched, uh, 1,600 educators were inscribed. Then it's, this is the dimension probably more spectacular of the Biennale, where artists were also collaborating, you know, talking with the educators and creating the propositions together. I invite you to explore the section of uh, um, education. Well, what means uh, for what, what what means for me that I was on charge of this team curating a biennial in pandemic and isolation? Well, the first thing for me was to take care of the teamwork. You have to think that the biennial is a private foundation, and the easy thing is if you don't have the exhibition, you stop all the contracts and you keep the money for I don't know but uh, then I have to continue with the project of the biennial then it was a responsibility to make the biennial it's not just an option no it's not just that you do or not for me it was a responsibility uh, to take care of the artists and resources the 70 fees were paid for the artists even if the works were never installed in the space to take care of moving from the real space to the screens and to work with a new team for making these movements and to take care of the existence of educational program. You have to think that uh, Porto Alegre Biennial is not an Airbnb Biennial. It's a Biennial um, where the citizens of Porto Alegre 
attend in, in a massive way. It has sometimes 3 million people of attendance. And for the state of Rio Grande do Sul also, then uh, the educational program is very important, is central in this biennial. Then how you can make an educational program if you don't have the space no? to, to move all these, these concepts? No? It's, uh, and I don't think that we were really successful. We, we did, that's why this question, no? what did we lose? What did we win? And a question that uh, we can give some kind of answers to these questions, but we can still answer this question if do we want to return to the state of the world that we left in March 2020. I think this is a kind of individual answer everybody can give. Then just to show you fastly some works very committed with feminism, you know, these are works from Argentinian artists. This work is a reference, direct the reference to the methodologies or the devices that poor women use for provoking an abortion. An abortion was legalized in Argentina on December the 30, 2020. Then uh, this is a uh, uh, are groups of activist uh, feminist artists that uh, create posters, affiches, and objects for demonstrations. No? Then the connection between artistic feminism and demonstrations, an artist that make a work about femicides in Argentina. Um, I will go fast. No? Some other problematics, uh, like a, a, a collective uh, public women that uh, consider that queer it's a word for uh, selected groups of the society, you know? And then they make the question, if you are too fat, too old, too black, or too poor to be queer, you no? Know? Because queer is, an, is a word that sounds strange in Spanish, you no? Know? Or um, performances around normalized or non-normalized bodies. Then a lot of performances works like, uh, the trilogy of Aline Mota from Brazil, that she travels to um, Nigeria. Then it's a work on, on uh, diaspora that explores the hidden roots, the hidden history of slavery in Brazil. No, that this is something that uh, um, is not present. It's recently present in Brazil, but it's a hidden history in Brazil. And for example, Dana Guavira, an artist from Zimbabwe, that she came to, to Porto Alegre to make a work about the Quilombos and all the process of um, escaping from slavery from uh, Black population. No? Then she, she, um, she make a very uh, contextual based research in Porto Alegre, but she transcribed or she represents this research through an abstract work. And she was in Porto Alegre when, when the, the, the isolation process began, when the airports were closing, then she was one of the artists we have to, to fastly make her to go back home. Works of uh, Brazilian artists like uh, Shanaina Bajos, uh, I dance in the ground in which I stepped, no? then I've shot videos where she danced in different parts of the city, working with this notion of what, which is your territory, is the nation, is the place where uh, you step, very beautiful because she performed with different costume and music, or um, Dominican Republic artists like Shoiri Minasha, who lives in New York, and then she, she makes a performance where she used her own body wet for a, erasing a mural she, she painted, no? Then, well, we can talk hours about these works, but also the poetics of the hair, no? Which is a, is a complete complex uh, issue, topic, um, then, that links artists like a uh, very uh, established artists like uh, Lorraine O'Grady from United States, but with uh, Priscilla Hessen from Brazil, where she used her hair um, 
which, which is called uh, the, the black women hair in Brazil is called bombril, that is uh, a brand of white wool for washing, uh, for washing uh, the dishes in the public square. No? Then all this poetic connected with memory, uh, then like Hosanna Paulino, an artist from Sao Paulo that she also collects hair with names. Then we dedicated, it was one of the honored artists like Monica Meyer, like Shuri Chicago, that was the first time she was in, in a biennial, the Garbilla Girls, um, Greta Stern, many artists and Esther, Esther Ferrer, from Spain, you know, very famous uh, feminist artists that were also uh, presented in the Biennale, or works like Uruguayan artists that makes a question and develop uh, developed a research around how uh, people that was blind since they born uh, represents attraction, uh, desire, sexuality. For people that never was able to see, no. Then she uh, conducted the research through different countries. Um, then, in this way, affects, no. Also, uh, how or uh, an artist, uh, a Mapuche artist from Chile, no, uh, questioning also um, this concept of a Mapuche nation inside of Chile country, and also questions around identity or Maruch Santis Gomez, a Totsil artist that also developed a research around uh, uh, Totsil knowledge that she wants to keep and she uh, condensate in these photographies. A photographer like Pasa Rasuris in Chile and the connections between her photography and the dictatorship in Chile, but also how, how is how are love relationships between people that is isolated in a mental institution? Or Vera Chavez Barcelos is an artist from Porto Alegre, you know, that she makes also a video around the world uh, with uh, women uh, presenting themselves. Then just a, a view of the, um, educational propositions, for example, uh, concepts, no violence against women, and then they were um, coordinated through questions and through activities and ways to go into the online platform, because this was the most difficult issue, no? how, how to navigate this universe. Then the propositions were uh, tools for navigating, even if I think that the biennial was not able, the online biennial, was not able to create uh, the, the best solutions, no? because we were in between the space, the, the physical space and the digital space. In doing this moving in, in, in less than one month, <laughs> then it was really the best we can do. And then I, I want to show you now a, a short uh, a teaser because, um, before to, to tell you, I will tell you a short story. Uh, I was in Buenos Aires. The team, the curatorial team was in crisis because we have different positions. Some wanted not to do anything because um, of course uh, we were critically connecting the new situation with exploitation of nature, uh, with extractivist, extractivist policies and make it the question how much or until such a point the world of art is also part of these um, policies that are devastating the world, the nature. Then um, part of the team didn't want to do anything and I accepted because uh, of course everybody has to feel and to do in this very extreme situation what they were able to do. But my question was, well, I was not in touch with the 70 artists because uh, some curators were in touch with some ones. Then I have the need to write a letter. Then I wrote a letter basically asking all the artists how they were. 
no? after 10 days of not knowing what to do. And the responses were so emotional and showing that they need to be in touch that then I, I, I proposed them to send a short film made with the cell phone. That was our first activity. And this is interesting because the complete biennial, the title was reframed and the word affects became the central. Then if at the beginning was women artists, then the second was democratic life, and then it was affects, no? Then if you can put um, the, the clipping for, for connecting with emotional. Um, so I will share the video and then we will talk with Sylvie also. Um. Hola a todos. Hola. Hola. Hi. Mi nombre es Jessica Caire. Mi nombre es Elena dos Santos. Maru Santis de México. Soy Sasha Sensual. Boliviana. Colombiana y vivo en Bogotá. Tengo 28 años. Activista y mamá. Ahora estoy en mi casa en Buenos Aires cumpliendo la cuarentena. Estamos en casa ya hace cinco semanas. Hace 20 días que no voy a mi estudio y... Yo vivo, yo pienso, yo respiro arte. Si las semanas atrás iba a viajar a Porto Alegre, me invita a la Bienal, la sección de la Bienal Mercosur. La Bienal número 12. Femeninos, visualidades, acciones y afectos. Se pone de forma que aparte se va a nos diga la situación cómica. Como dibujar en el espacio. La palabra un vídeo. Fotografía. Opas. Son piezas muy emotivas. ¿Qué es ser mujer negra en una sociedad? ¿Qué cultura, qué sociedad estamos proyectando? Para seguir construyendo esta idea de un mundo ideal donde habitar. After the lockdown is finished. We will be free to meet. Con fuerza el afecto por los otros y las otras. Yo no veo la hora de ver a las personas. Un abrazo. Un abrazo. Saludos. Saludos, Soleil. Y es eso. Ok. Well, even if it's not in English, I think that it's very, very communicative piece and it uh, condensates well the emotion we were feeling every time that the testimony was arriving, you know, then that artists were recording from where they were. And then um, I think that the first communication with the virtual audience was through these small testimonies that we were applauding and, and creating you know this transition then well um, well thanks so much andre i think um i want to make sure that we have time also for you and sylvie to talk you know since uh, and uh and so what i will do is also for for there there are a good number of people you know who are with us in the audience one of the awkward things about webinars is we don't see who's there but but i know there's many people who who are who are listening and we want them to be part of the conversation so while you and sylvie talk about Sylvie has her own ideas and questions, but also what you just presented. I will step back and I will be looking at questions in the Q&A so that then when we come back in 10, 15 minutes, we can still uh, address some of these questions from the audience for you, okay? And si quieren hacer preguntas en español, por favor, háganlo. Y yo voy a estar checando las preguntas, sí. En portugués. <laughs> portugués también, sí. <laughs> okay. So Sylvie, I don't know if you have something directly that you can. Yes, well, thank you so much, uh, Pedro and uh, Mignon for the invitation. And it's such an honor to um, have an opportunity to speak with Andrea. Um, I mean, what you've done is, is exemplary and uh, I, I'm really happy that we can dig a little bit deeper. I guess my first question, um, maybe because I'm a curator as well, is one of methodology. So, um, and uh, I guess, more precisely, you were talking about this moment of uh, having to make a decision and uh, 
tensions within the, the curatorial team and at the same time this sort of outreach to educators um, everywhere and having this response so how um, you know you didn't know what the response was going to be so how did you kind of set up what what sort of process was put in place to welcome the voice of the artists and their desires the ability and the capacity of the curatorial team and then um, the, the needs and and wishes of of educators all around. So if you could tell us a little bit about how you did that and, and what you learned in the process. Hmm. Well, how I did that, I don't have a methodology. The basic <laughs> methodology for me is that I believe that art is completely relevant. <laughs> it's very important. Then I have this complete confidence that uh, it's not something accessory. Then in this moment, it was more important to have place for art. Then um, I moved for through enthusiasm, capability of working and to, to transmit this enthusiasm to the team. And, and, and I do, I don't know. Uh, I don't take care if, uh, if it's, uh, I am not checking maybe, you know, I am so sure when I have to move through this exceptionalist moment, you know, it's this moment where everything changed, uh, like, like that it was similar with the Leon Ferrari exhibition, no? because <laughs> you, you are in front of a big problem. Then um, is the, um, the belief that art has something to say and it's very important what, uh, what move it. But I have, of course, uh, the support of, of the director of the foundation, which is a person, um, Gilberto Schwarzman, that uh, it's also very confident on art. He was very confident on my work. He supported me 100% and he made everything for, uh, for you know, re-articulate the team because of course we need a new team for, for uh, designing the platform. Um, and and a, a great team of the Biennial, you know, the, the team that is every, every two years working in the Biennial that sustained the structure of the Biennial, no, they were also very positive. Then um, uh, how I, will, I move, it's also um, because I was like, a, I feel that feelings were the most important thing. Then I have to re-articulate everything through what I feel and what the others were feeling, because basically we were going into a completely new world situation. It never happened that everybody was in their houses. How, how we're changing my feelings and how we're changing the feelings of the artists. Then it was based on that, in the exploration and this new situation, on the confidence on art and the confidence on education. Then how, how we can put these things together. And of course, many things were not well done because of course the, the digital platform was not conceived for such a big task. And the design was negotiating all the time between something that was um, almost in the space, you know, CV very well, that uh, you are working with the architects, then you know exactly where each work. I have the feeling that the biennial happened because I have so many maps, projections, and work with the architect that uh, we, we knew perfectly how it will look the biennial. Um, and then uh, creating new resources and also um, trying to, to keep the confidence of the team together. No? Then it's a work, uh, it's, it's not a plan, was not a plan plan at all <laughs> but uh, all the work was based on this um, on these um, elements no the team the confidence the uh, belief on on the place of art and the belief on the place of on the role the new role of education and I think that uh, well we lose a lot of things and we win a lot of things and we are still evaluating. And, yeah, and I'd like to shift the conversation a little bit to, um, um, sorry, am I, I'm on mute, yes. I'd like to shift the conversation a little bit to, um, to the artists who were presented in, in, um, 
in or expected to be presented in the biennial. One of the things that struck me was, um, you know, the presence of very famous artists who typically would not be in a biennial. And um, so, for example, Judy Chicago, Esther Ferrer, or um, uh, Condé and Beveridge from Canada. Um, so a very interesting kind of anchoring or um, sort of mapping out a sort of history of feminism through people whose work, you know, who are still very active, but a very specific kind of mapping out. And so I was wondering about um, why do this in Porto Alegre in 2020? So if you could talk a little bit about your intentions there and, and those choices. Well, you know, when you are creating the biennial, you have some concepts that are articulating uh, the, the, the research of the artist, but uh, at the same time, you have a lot of them. Then I wanted to explain them because uh, with radical women, I didn't have this freedom because I, I was committed with, with history, with research, with archives, with the representation of erased artists. In a biennial, you don't need uh, to negotiate with these uh, ideas. You don't need to give representation to a race of artists necessary. You want to give space to unknown artists, very young artists, uh, which, which it happened because many people uh, said, well, our, some artists are completely unknown. No? Then this, um, it was also, um, um, based on the confidence on the curatorial team. I let uh, them completely independence and, you know, then we were discussing the articulation, how they were articulated through the concept that were in the title on the Bayana, but uh, not, a, it's a very different experience, no? Then, um, then that's why I think it's a very, uh, unusual selection no and for example Shudi Chicago for me was amazing because uh, we went to to the house of Shudi Chicago in Albuquerque in Belen we were living in her house and discovering a, a, a completely different artist that I I thought she was through the books no then um, well it was great for me because uh, to to show the works of Shudi uh, in Latin America that it didn't happen <laughs> unfortunately are online but uh, I thought that it would be amazing in this context and crossing with these other artists you no know, Shudi Chicago and Esther Ferrer or and and Rosana Paulino. Then uh, for me well Bayana is more what happened in the space crossing unexpected uh, artists than the work that you think when you are curating a historical exhibition. Then it's not that I was planning every detail, you let a part to uh, what it happened in the space. You know, that is the great experience of, of a biennial, I think. I don't know if I am answering completely your question, but this was the process, honestly. No, not, not to plan and leaving uh, autonomy to the curators and having conversations about, well, how, how was, and, and even when you read the, the essays, you will see that uh, curators were following different concepts after when they were writing the, the essays. And think, I think that the catalog will enrich very much because new concepts appear like the role of domesticity that in the isolation reveals the centrality of domesticity. And then um, uh, Dorota, Dorota Bixel is her essays uh, centered on this notion. And um, Fabiana Lopez uh, wrote about uh, gathering, no? How, how the dynamics of uh, gathering and things that she was dreaming it will happen in the biennial and it, it happened through the leaves, uh, the, 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 the online conversations, but not through, not in the biennial. And this is one of the big things we, we lose, no? Whatever it will be happening in the biennial in terms of uh, uh, dance, in terms of uh, collective works and so many things that, well, this is what we, we lose. No, works that we don't know how it will finally be. 
I think, um, Sylvie, if you have other questions, I think there will be time, but I want to make sure to kind of interweave some from the audience, right? So, um, uh, Andrea, there's uh, what the audience only sees the, the questions once, uh, once we start responding to them. So I will mark them as re responded to, and then people can see what people have been asking. But the first one is from Gabriela Robles, eh, y pregunta en español, si pudieron coincidir entre las curadoras y las artistas en las visiones sobre el feminismo. ¿Cuáles fueron algunas de las cosas que llamaran la atención en términos del feminismo como concepto y las formas de representarlo? Um, do you want to start with that? La pregunta sobre qué es el feminismo es una pregunta que no tiene una respuesta. Y precisamente por eso feminismos o femeninos, más que feminismos, y ya con Cecilia Fajardo nosotros hicimos una diferencia muy fuerte entre entre un arte femenino o un arte feminista, ¿no? En, en, tanto, en tanto un arte feminista implica agency, ¿no? Implica una operación también de empowering y también un activismo, ¿no? Un, un activismo que puede pasar por lo colectivo, pero un activismo que puede pasar también eh, por asumir una agenda en términos políticos, ¿no? Es decir, llamarse a uno mismo feminista, to call yourself feminist, it means a political position. Es una posición política, ¿no? Can I translate briefly, you know, uh, so, so um, to, for those of you who, who don't speak Spanish, I'll, I'll do a very brief, basically, for example, with, uh, you know, Andrea was saying how there's not a single way to answer what is feminism, right? There's, there's multiple ways and, and, you know, and so with past work, for example, with Cecilia Fajardo Gil, uh, Andrea and, and, and Cecilia really clar clarified the difference between feminist and feminine, right? So feminine artist is very different than a feminist artist who a feminist artist takes on a position on feminisms, you know, or feminism and, and becomes an agent, right? Like, and has a kind of a political motivation. So I, I hope I did that right. <laughs> yeah. And then um, it was a discussion we have during the process of the Biennial. Um, Fabiana, for example, was wondering, well, what means to be an African Latin American feminist artist? No, then it was more an open question uh, than uh, the idea to give a response that was in, in the, the seminal project for me was, well, uh, we close a historical exhibition. I want to open the space for many questions, possibilities. And you have to think also that uh, feminism is not, a, it, it's, it has been expanded. The most important section of the library uh, created in the last five years it's connected with feminism. Feminism is not just thinking about the rights of women, it's thinking about economy, it's thinking about political uh, systems, it's thinking on the connections with nature, on several, how uh, the, the justice system, the concept of law. Uh, you know, feminism is involved with so many areas that uh, you can open the discussion to different fields, but it's not just uh, one, one way to define uh, what is feminist art, uh, because, and even uh, also we should add that uh, artists could not identify themselves as feminists, but we can have as a curator a feminist approach to the works of some artists then this is something important also then maybe we have a feminist approach to historical artists like Greta Stern that we don't know if Greta Stern was representing herself as a feminist then um, it is a complicated issue more than a single answer that I can give you and we wanted uh, to problematize, uh, to open up an, a scenario for different possibilities, problematics, ways of connecting between people, um, you know, the dynamics were also involved with the feminist ways of working, connecting. Then uh, I can give a, a single answer because it was not, and even it was not relevant for the curatorial team to define what feminism is. Or what yeah. is the connection between art and feminism? 
Yeah, and you know, uh, Mario, I'm, I'm just going to add a few more, Andrea, if that's okay. So Mario Caro said he apologizes because he joined the wonderful presentation a little late, so he maybe he missed it, but he wants to learn more about indigenous artists in the show. Like I know, for example, you mentioned the Tzotzil or art, you know, but there may have been others. And Marina Frugoli se dice gracias por la, por, la, y queri, y queri, por la presentación y quería escuchar si hubo algún tipo de censura antes de la pandemia por parte del gobierno de Bolsonaro. So maybe we can start with those two. Well, <laughs> uh, two questions. Well, indigenous artists, um, you know, curators, we are haunting themes, topics, <laughs> agendas, no? Uh, I have uh, ethical issues also about that uh, in terms of, uh, well, who I am, from where I am representing the world of art, knowing the world of art, um, how the world of art is articulated, how market is articulated with the world of art, then um, for me it's important uh, not to, to work with the fetishization or exotization of the others. Um, the voice of the others is completely relevant. Um, there are processes of empathy, then there are many processes that I analyze uh, when I was doing uh, curating radical women. Then in this case, I didn't want to be really in the position of, uh, I wanted really to be convinced uh, in which way indigenous artists were represented. Then are represented basically by uh, Sebastián Calfuqueo, that is a Mapuche artist, and he identifies himself as a Mapuche, then he presents him, himself and his poetic has to do with this uh, concept of a Mapuche nation inside of a Republican nation like Chile and Argentina, because the Mapuche nation, uh, it's uh, in both countries, in Argentina and in Chile. And, um, um, Maruch Santis, because I, I find the process of her work amazing um, in terms of poetic, in terms of um, the, the images she elaborate. Then I, I was taking care, you know, not to be hunting artists for, for having representations in the Biennial that I didn't know well. Then I wanted to understand, to know well and not to be like, you know, um, there are some cases of artists that became connected with the Yanomani community that are being very much in the market. I have question marks on that, no? Then uh, it was an exploration that is also at the beginning. I think that is, uh, it's also a process through which artists uh, that represents themselves as Mapuche or Tzotzil want to go into the world of art. For me, this is important also that an artist want to belong to the world of art and know that it's an exotic piece that I am introducing in the world of art. And this empowered position as an artist is also important. Uh, Maruch Santis is, a, is an artist. She wanted to travel to the Biennale. She wanted to be there. She was calling me. She is in my uh, WhatsApp. I have connection with her. Uh, she is completely committed with uh, her community, but with art. Then it's a difficult process, you know. I don't want to make. Um, well, I think that is understandable. What I mean, I have ethical issues. Then I was exploring who, which were some of the artist, young artist like uh, Sebastian that was now is uh, like three years older than when I invited to the Biennale, <laughs> but very young when I invited him to the Biennale, him, her, because he's a no binary artist. And Maruch Santis, uh, it's uh, an artist that is well recognized, but probably not on the top of the wave now. Then for me, this process of uh, bringing to the present artists that were important maybe in the 90s or at the beginning of the 21st century, but 
now are not uh, so present. And, and she did the work uh, since the 90s, that is an incredible work, no? Um, 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 so uh, I will just, rather than ask the questions, I'm, I'm going to frame some of the things that have been put in the Q&A as comments. So Michael Carroll says it's really gr great that artists like Judy Chicago are included in the biennial, right? There's, there's this long history of really important feminist artists who have not been part of the biennial circuit. So, so he, he points that out, which you mentioned. And also, you know, there's a question of whether the catalog can be bought in the US. So you can answer that if you want. I'm sure it can be. But um, the, um, the last one that I throw in there is that uh, from Mary Louise Bennett, um, that, that she really appreciates how you prioritize taking care as your response to the pandemic, right? So I will. Uh, I want to make sure that you and Sylvie have a last uh, back and forth uh, if we have time for it. And then I think we can just uh, perhaps say goodbye. And if you want to address some of these last things that I mentioned, we can. I guess my last question will be quite simply, um, you know, what, what has been your biggest learning through this? You know, now you're sort of a few months um, from the, the event, we're in slightly different horizon in terms of the pandemic. Um, and, and so what's the most important thing you've learned through this very careful and caring process? Um, well, good uh, question and difficult to answer because I learned a lot of things. I learned that, uh, I learned about myself, no? I learned about myself about uh, how extreme it was the situation and how much um, I need to do something, even if I was completely isolated at home. Then this um, contrast between the isolation and the work that you have in this circumstance was uh, a process of learning. And I was very much involved since then on exploring, and I am now involved in a process that I want to work with the Ministry of Culture and, and an exhibition I opened uh, two weeks ago. I want to work in another dimension. I think that is a huge field for exploring. Um, I learned that, uh, that it was a painful process. It was very painful for many things. People around us was getting sick, uh, was in the hospital, we lost people. Then it is a process that even if I can look uh, confident and enthusiastic, is full of pain, uh, real pain. No? Uh, I think that nobody, when it's going out of this process without pain. And, and I learned that, uh, well, something that I, I knew before, art has a place, an important role, and, 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 and I learned also that um, it is a lot to do in, in this new moment, and it's a new field we have to reframe. I think that you, Sylvie, are wondering what it will happen with Biennials. Everybody is wondering, you know, that uh, Berlin Biennial was uh, opening a, bit, a little bit later, uh, in, in Berlin, but it was a very uh, sanitary, sanitarized context where then this uh, extremely populated event that the Biennale represents in the opening is not happening, it didn't happen, and we don't know if, if it will happen in the future. Then it's a moment where we have to rethink Biennals. What is the role of the Biennals? Uh, and you know, the Sao Paulo Biennale has been postponed and how the context is in Brazil, I don't think that they will open this year because in this context, I, I don't think so. And the, the Venice Biennale has been postponed for one year. We don't know what it will happen. Then I think it's a, it's a moment where we have to think, but not to think that Biennale's have not to exist anymore, but uh, Bayanos had a role on rethinking, rethinking the world, rethinking everything, has a place uh, and a responsibility and probably should, uh, I hope that transitory reframe, I hope that uh, 
we can go to some kind of new good normality because the, what was normal in March 2020 is not uh, something I personally want to go back. Um, but uh, then if we are in a moment that we can learn something of uh, this global experience, I think Biennials has something to, to do, to say, to collaborate on, on that. You know? There's one, one question popped up that I can't not ask, which is from Cecilia Fajardo, who I know is a long time interlocutor uh, of yours, but also this question I think is a great question for the entire series and it is, what is the valuable specificity of a Biennale versus a historical or more theme focus driven project, you know? Um, so even if we don't have time to spend a long answer, I think it's a, it's a great question. So I'm curious if you have a short uh, answer to Cecilia. Uh, yeah, well, um, in a way, I was responding, answering this question, no? uh, uh, but uh, Celia and I, we were working, uh, doing so much research uh, with the responsibility to cover a historical period of time, then uh, this is the responsibility of a historical exhibition, you know, to have a concept uh, to know what is the frame and to work with responsibility to do research about this period. In, in a way, a uh, historical exhibition is like a kind of corset, it's more uh, structured in some way. I think that the biennial gives you more freedom, but the, the responsibility you have towards history in an uh, exhibition, uh, historical exhibition, you you have more to rethink in the contemporaneity and to bring in works of the past that you want to reactivate in the context of the present. That is something that is also present in a historical exhibition because you don't make a historical exhibition to create a box in the past. You bring these works to the present because you think that it, there are a lot of things uh, useful, important, relevant for the present, no? But uh, in, in a biennial, you have I think I feel with more freedom. And also, of course, when you have a curatorial team, you have to negotiate things, no? But uh, more freedom, yeah, more freedom. And this is probably what uh, which um, allowed a lot of uh, activities more involved with what we were experiencing in this moment, no? To talk about isolation, to talk about domesticity, to talk about uh, new, uh, the, visual, the new visualization of racism that happened during the pandemic, you know, it were topics that were coming once and again, then this possibility to think about what, what it was happening, you know, because the present was so relevant and it was unexpectedly a common present. Then the common present, everybody was in the same situation. Then this, is, this was one of the things or the great opportunities we have to think about uh, this painful and complex experience uh, through uh, the Zoom platforms that were like inaugurated in this moment um, and to, to, to share in experiences and to talk about these topics together with art, no? together with art. Uh, I think well, that I think that's yeah, that's a wonderful way to 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 end. Perhaps uh, it, in a way, we're just getting started, right, with this <laughs> uh, kind of analysis of the difference between the historical shows and the biennials. But but thanks so much, Andrea and and uh, and Sylvie. This was a great conversation. Uh, but uh, thank you and um, good good luck with all the all the work and projects. Thank you, thank you very much, Pedro and Sylvie.